Hey everyone, and welcome to another one of my weekly art videos. I hope you're having an amazing day wherever you are in the world, and thanks so much for joining me on this one. Today, I am sharing a full class on color theory and color temperature for beginners, with lots of exercises that I would highly recommend experimenting with so that you can progress your skills faster. This video was especially created for those of you just getting started with painting and color theory. However, if you're farther ahead in your painting journey and you're still struggling with color temperature, just understanding it, or with being able to tell whether a color is warm or cool biased, this one will be very helpful for you as well. We're going to be working on two separate six part color wheels. A six part color wheel is a color wheel that has primary colors and secondary colors in it. One of these color wheels is going to be filled in using a set of warm primaries, meaning a warm red, a warm blue and a warm yellow. And the second color wheel is going to be filled in with cool primaries meaning a cool red, a cool blue, and a cool yellow. And of course, before we actually fill in our color wheel with all of these colors and color mixtures, we first need to be able to pick warm and cool primaries. So I'm gonna be sharing my entire paint color selection process with you, and I'll be sharing must-know information and tips with you so that you can also choose your own. After finishing with our color wheels, I've also added a final bonus section in this video where I explain what happens with grays and browns. How can you tell if grays or browns are cool biased or warm biased? And how can you alter or change the temperature of a gray and a brown? We'll be talking about all of that in the last portion of this video, so do stay tuned for that. But for now, let's go ahead and get started with our color wheels. First thing is first, and we need to choose our two sets of primaries, our warm primaries and our cool primaries. And before jumping in, I want to briefly explain what the term color temperature refers to in art. Color temperature simply means the perceived warmth or coolness of a given color. A little bit later, I'm going to be explaining how color temperature is really relative because it depends on the context that the color has been used in. Rarely are you going to be using colors completely by themselves. They're going to be surrounded by other colors. And that overall context is going to have a great impact on what we perceive to be the temperature of the piece as a whole and of specific colors used within that piece. And the way that I like seeing it, colors are warmer or cooler than other colors. It's all relative and the way that I see it, there are no absolutes. Now, a lot of us who are lucky to have art classes in elementary or secondary or high school, we learn about the color wheel and how it can be divided into cool and warm halves. We learn that blue, purple, and green are cool colors and that red, orange, and yellow are warm colors. And this isn't wrong and there is some value in knowing this, but it's an oversimplified way of understanding color temperature because the fact of the matter is that every single color, every primary, every secondary has a multitude of cool and warm biased options. This said, I want you to keep that idea in your head moving forward. You have two warm primaries, which are yellow and red, and you have one cool primary, which is blue. So what I've done here is I have grabbed a few of my watercolor sets that I am currently using, and I'm gonna be testing a whole bunch of different yellows, reds, and blues right here on screen for you. I'll be swatching these out while I provide some must-know information and tips that will help you decide if a color is warm or cool. And we can choose which colors we want to bring in into our color wheels based on the options we have available. And may I suggest you do the same if you have different watercolor sets or even individual tubes, grab some of those and test these different colors out. Sometimes if you just have one set on hand, maybe you don't have a warm or a cool of a specific primary. Maybe you ran out. And in that case, you're probably going to have to bring in some paint from a different brand or whatever the case may be, but that's totally fine. But if you just have one watercolor set and it's relatively large, 
it's very likely that you do have a warm and a cool color for each of your primaries because these tend to bring in split primaries, meaning warm and cool primaries into those palettes. But as always, I want to encourage you to use what you have. This is an exercise in color and color mixing. We're not actually creating a painting, so the objective here is just to understand color more. Personally, I'm gonna be using my main palette, which I'm using currently, which contains a mixture of paint from Daniel Smith and Winsor & Newton's professional line. Then my palette on the left is from St. Petersburg. This is their White Knights paint, and those are full pans. The half pan set on the right is a student grade set from Van Gogh. So I'm starting with my yellows, and all I am doing here is I am taking out different yellows that I feel will come in handy for my primaries in my color wheels from my different watercolor sets or palettes. And I have these two labels on one of these scrap pieces of watercolor paper. And right now, before swatching anything out, I am just categorizing them under warm or cool based on the color that I am seeing in that pen or in that well. Do I think this is a warm yellow that I'm seeing or a cool yellow that I'm seeing? A warm yellow is gonna look more like an orange or a mustardy color because it has a teeny tiny bit of red in it. It is gonna be closer to orange than to green in the color wheel. Orange and green are the two secondaries that are next to yellow in the color wheel, on either side of yellow in the color wheel. So to explain this in a very simplified way, a cool yellow is going to have a little bit of blue in it. Blue is a cool primary, so that is a cool yellow. A warm yellow, on the other hand, is going to have a tiny bit of red in it. Red is a warm primary, so that would be a warm yellow. Right here, I have a couple of different warm yellows in this other set. I can't really take these out from the palette because these are wells that have been filled in with tubes, but I'm also going to be swatching these out. All right, so getting started with my swatches here. The first yellow that you're gonna see me swatch is Cadmium Yellow Medium from St. Petersburg. The second yellow that I'm gonna be swatching out is Indian Yellow from Van Gogh. Moving on from there, I'm going to be swatching Hansa Yellow Deep from Daniel Smith and New Gamboge from Windsor & Newton. Moving on from there, I'm going to be swatching out Cadmium Lemon from St. Petersburg and Lemon Yellow from Van Gogh. Then I'm going to be swatching out Windsor Lemon from Windsor & Newton. Now that I've swatched out all of these yellows, I'm going to be choosing the warm yellow and the cool yellow that I'm going to be using for my two color wheels. I decide to go with New Gamboge for my warm yellow and Windsor Lemon for my cool yellow. I do want to mention a couple of super important things that you should definitely know. Firstly, as I said in the beginning of this video, color temperature is relative. I always like explaining to my students that it's better to see a color as being warmer than or cooler than, than simply being warm or cool. What's important to remember is that we are understanding color in order to use these different colors in combination in full art pieces. And whether we judge a color to be warm or cool is really going to depend on the colors that have been used around it. So even though it is very important that you are able to tell if a color is warm or cool bias when you swatch it out, it's ultimately going to depend on the context that that color is being used in. Because a color that we might see as being the coolest color in a piece might end up looking like the warmest color in another context. And the second thing that is very important that you remember is that this is all like a range or different degrees of warmth and coolness. 
And what I mean by this is even within the four warm yellows that I swatched out, some of these look warmer than others. For example, the upper swatch to the right is warmer than the upper left swatch. But in the grand scheme of things, both of these would be regarded as warm yellows. Same thing could happen with the cool yellows. One of these could look cooler to you than the others. And something you're likely going to notice moving forward in your journey with watercolor is that the temperature of certain colors tend to change. They tend to be cooler or warmer in certain brands versus other brands. For example, I will be swatching out my Payne's Gray from Windsor & Newton and my Payne's Gray from St. Petersburg in the last part of this video. And you're going to notice that the Payne's Gray from Windsor & Newton looks a lot bluer than the Payne's Gray from St. Petersburg. And that could happen with other colors as well. But don't let any of this overwhelm you or confuse you. Ultimately, what matters is that you're able to swatch out the color and be able to tell whether it has some other color mixed into it. Not only because the temperature of different colors that you use in a full painting is going to have an impact on the overall color scheme and composition of the end result, but also because this way you'll avoid creating undesired colors. Because let's just say that you are trying trying to make a purple and you know that to create purple you need to mix together blue and red but you choose a blue that has green in it so it's a cool bias blue and you mix it together with the warm red which is leaning more towards the orange side you're likely going to create a desaturated brownish sometimes even grayish looking color because you're mixing more than two colors together and that's not going to give you purple it's going to give you another color. Remember that whenever you mix two opposites in the color wheel together, if you mix enough of these two together, you're going to get a brown or a gray. So this means that if the two colors that you chose to mix together have two complementary colors in them, you're going to start creating a desaturated or muted down color. And this isn't to say that desaturated colors are wrong or that muted down colors are something that you should stay away from, not at all. In fact, lots of watercolor artists who are going for higher levels of realism desaturate and mute down their colors by bringing in a complementary or a neutral and mix it in because in real life, most colors around us are desaturated to different degrees and they know that those color choices are going to help them achieve the level of realism that they're after but they are intentionally choosing those colors that they are bringing into their different mixtures they are strategically muting down their colors what we want to stay away from is doing it by accident if you're not aware of the color's temperature that you're bringing in, especially if it's one of those colors that has a lot of another color mixed in you might be mixing together three colors instead of two and so you need to be aware of these things when you are choosing your colors that you're going to be using for a new piece. And even if you do like saturated colors and you're not going for a super high level of realism, most likely than not, you're going to want to achieve lighter value areas, midtone areas, and darker value areas so that your piece can really have a sense of dimension in it and depth. And in order to achieve those different values or tones of your different colors, you need to know about color mixing. You need to know which color to bring in to lighten that color or to bring in to darken that color. Okay, so I have finished swatching out six different blues and I am now choosing the blues that I'm going to be using for my color wheels. I started out by swatching my cobalt blue from St. Petersburg. I then swatched out my ultramarine blue from Van Gogh, then Prussian blue by Van Gogh, phthalo blue by St. Petersburg, phthalo blue by Daniel Smith, and finally bright blue by St. Petersburg. Blues have always been the most challenging primary for me to tell in terms of color temperature. There are some artists that think that every single color is either warm or cool biased. I am of the belief that there are mid-range colors that are neither warm nor cool. They are somewhere in between. And I think this happens with lots of blues out there. But a warm blue is red biased. It's going to be leaning more toward the purple than toward the green. 
If you swatch out your blue and it looks like it has a tiny bit of green in it, that is a cool biased blue. So again, think of the secondaries next to blue in the color wheel. You're going to have purple on one side and you're going to have green on the other. When you swatch out your blue, notice if it's leaning more toward the purple or toward the green or if it sits somewhere in between. For me, cooler blues have always been easier to tell. I can tell that these four blues that I've swatched out on the right have at least a tiny bit of green in them. And I can tell that the ultramarine blue here on the lower left is leaning a little bit more towards the purple side. So that is a warm blue. I'm gonna go with the safe option for the warm, which is the ultramarine blue. And for my cool blue, I'm gonna be choosing my phthalo blue from Daniel Smith. And finally, it is time to choose our two reds. By the way, I've been making sure to change my water in my container in between all of these different primaries, and I've been making sure to completely rinse out my paintbrush bristles in between my colors so that I don't risk polluting the next color. And this is something that is gonna be very important for us to do as we are filling in our color wheels. Do your best to use clean water and also to rinse out your paintbrush bristles in between your different colors. And you also want to keep your colors organized on your mixing palette. You don't want them to start seeping into each other. The way that you can tell whether a red is warm or cool is reds that are warm are going to look more orangey. And reds that are cool are going to look more like a wineish color or leaning more towards the purple. So once again, going back to the color wheel, the two secondaries that are next to red in the color wheel are purple and orange. So when you swatch out your red, try to notice if that color looks a little bit more orange, which means it has a little bit of yellow in it. So it would be warm biased. Or does it look like it has a tiny bit of blue in it? in which case that would be a cool biased red. So first I just take out those full pans and half pans and I just categorize them in terms of what I see before swatching anything out. I'm just going through the same process of placing them under the warm primary label or the cool primary label based on what I see in there, which might or might not be the correct temperature once I actually swatch the color out. This particular red that I have in my hand right now is what I would see as an in-between red. It seems cooler to me in the pan, but I need to swatch it out to know for sure. And in this other set, I also have a variety of reds, including three reds that look quite warm. And I also have quinacridone rose and alizarin crimson, which are cool reds or more magenta-y colors, which by the way, pinks are considered warm because they are a version of red. However, once the pink starts turning into a purple or a more magenta-y color, that would be a cool pink because that means that that pink has a little bit of blue in it, and blue is a cool primary. The first red that I'm gonna be swatching out is Cadmium Red Light from St. Petersburg. The second red that I'm gonna be swatching out is Permanent Red Light from Van Gogh. The third red that I'm gonna be swatching out is Permanent Red Deep from Van Gogh. The fourth red is Carmine from St. Petersburg, and this is a pinky, magenta-y looking color. The next red that I'm gonna be swatching out is Pyrrole Red from Daniel Smith. The next red is Pyrrole Scarlet from Daniel Smith. By swatching out these two reds by Daniel Smith, I can tell that Pyrrole Scarlet is warmer than Pyrrole Red. Then I have Alizarin Crimson from Windsor & Newton. And finally, I'm going to be swatching out Mayan Orange from Daniel Smith. I ended up with a pretty good range of reds here, as you can see. And these swatches are just all over the place on this extra watercolor sheet that I swatched them out on because I decided to swatch out some reds last minute and I was running out of space. For my warm red, I decide to go with Pyrrol Scarlet. And for my cool red, I decide to go with Alizarin Crimson. 
All right, so just to conclude the color selection process for my two color wheels, I go ahead and create this little uh, cheat sheet or little card for myself so that I can remember which colors I'm using along the way and make sure that I'm not accidentally bringing in another red, another yellow, another blue. I wanna make sure that I stick to using the three primaries for each color wheel that I have chosen. I recommend you do the same before getting started with filling in your color wheels or at the very least write down the name of the specific red, yellow, and blue that you're gonna be using for your warm and cool color wheels. And make sure that you've pinpointed their location in your palette or that you have taken out that little pen from your pan set, depending on what it is that you're using. This always helps me not mess up when I am filling in my color wheels, because if you do use another color, then the entire color wheel is gonna be completely useless. It's gonna be messed up. Okay, so jumping right into filling in our two color wheels. You can see how I've created a couple of templates for myself right here on a watercolor sheet. This is watercolor paper from Arches. I just traced around a circular object that I felt was a good size, and then I used a ruler to create my lines, and I made sure to have six equal spaces or relatively equal spaces or pie pieces in each color wheel so that I can paint in the three primaries and my three secondaries in between my primaries. If you wanna take this exercise further and create a 12 part color wheel so that you can paint in the tertiary colors, that is up to you. And that is also a great exercise, a greater challenge because you need to really play around with the ratios of your colors and your color mixtures to create your tertiary colors. But for total beginners, I would definitely recommend that you start with a six part color wheel. In this color wheel that I've been using, the primary colors are pointed out with the solid gray triangle, the secondary colors are pointed out with the black triangle, and the tertiary colors would be all of the ones that are not pointed out with anything. So they are sitting in between a primary and a secondary color. If you mix that primary and that secondary, you're gonna get that tertiary color. And these tertiary colors are oftentimes the ones that have a hyphen in the name. So blue-green, blue-purple, red-orange, yellow-orange, all of those are tertiary colors. The first thing that I do is I choose my brushes. Right now I'm using a size 10 round brush to prepare these first color mixtures, but I'm gonna be switching to a size 14 round to actually paint in the color wheels. The size 14 round brush I feel is appropriate for the size of these shapes that I'm gonna be painting in. It's gonna allow me to paint those shapes nice and quick so that I'm not left with any lines or undesired textures in those small washes. I also made sure to change my water once again before getting started. With those supplies on hand, I created my three puddles of my three primaries. And I'm starting with the warm color wheel, so my yellow is my new gamboge, the red is the pyrrole scarlet, and the blue is the ultramarine blue. Consistencies of your color mixtures are important when you're filling in a color wheel. You wanna make sure that the consistencies of your different colors that you are painting with are relatively the same. And what I mean by this is you don't want to paint in certain sections with paint that is super watered down and other sections with paint that is super thick. So just to keep it nice and simple, I try to go for a coffee to milk-like consistency with all of my color mixtures that I'm gonna be using. So let's just say around 50% paint and 50% water in my different color mixtures so that the intensity or darkness is relatively the same. This way we can really judge colors at the end when we're making our observations. Once I had my puddles of my three primaries ready to go for my warm color wheel, I started painting in those sections of my color wheel, making sure to leave an empty space in between each for my secondaries. Make sure that you're completely rinsing out your paintbrush bristles in between your different colors. You don't wanna pollute the next color. Now that my primary colors have been painted in, it's time to create my secondary colors. And this is where it gets a little bit more challenging. 
you have to make sure that you're creating your secondaries with your three primaries that you already started using, the colors that you've chosen for this color wheel. I decided to get started with the green. And for this green, of course, I am mixing together the warm yellow that I have chosen, which is New Gamboge, and the warm blue that I have chosen, which is Ultramarine Blue. What you're seeing me do right here is I am continuing to modify the ratios of each color in my color mixture, adding a little bit more yellow, a little bit more blue, swiveling my paintbrush in that mixture to really mix everything together well until I arrive at a color that looks green to me on my mixing palette. I make sure that the consistency is what I want it to be, so somewhere between coffee to milk-like consistency, and then I just go ahead and fill in that triangle. Once I'm done with my green, I remove all of that green from my paintbrush bristles, super, super important, and I go ahead and get started with my orange color mixture. I just start mixing together my two puddles of yellow and red that I already had right here in this section of my mixing palette because those are the two colors that I need for my orange. And then I just go ahead and continue adding either more yellow or more red into my mixture until I arrive at a secondary orange. Once that color looks good to me, I start painting in the orange section. And before getting started with my purple color mixture, I make sure to clean out my paintbrush once again. And you can also see how I am cleaning out this section of my mixing palette so that I can create my purple color mixture and make sure that it is not polluted with the previous colors. Once I'm ready, I take some of my Pyro Scarlet and I'm gonna take some of my Ultramarine Blue, mix these two colors together until I get something that looks like a secondary purple. Right now it's looking too much like a red purple, so I add in a little bit more blue. And once it seems like a secondary purple to me, I quickly paint in that triangular area. And with that, we're all done with the warm color wheel. Let's now move on to the cool color wheel. I cleaned out my palette and I changed my water. And first I'm gonna get started with just the three primaries by themselves with some water added in. So my cool yellow is my Windsor Lemon, my cool red is Alizarin Crimson, and my cool blue is Phthalo Blue. Right here, I'm just making sure that the consistencies are what I want them to be, somewhere between coffee to milk-like consistency. And then I clean out my paintbrush bristles and I get started with the lightest color of the bunch and I'm gonna make my way towards the blue, which is the darkest. I make sure to leave an empty space in between each one of my primaries so that I can fill in my secondaries when I am done. Getting started with my Alizarin Crimson section here, I made sure to load up my paintbrush bristles well, and then I painted that section in nice and quick so that I can avoid creating lines and undesired textures, because remember that paint is drying very quickly, especially because we're painting on dry paper. Dry paper is thirsty paper, so that paint is gonna absorb very fast. And then it was time to paint in my phthalo blue. Now that I'm done with my three cool primaries, I'm gonna go ahead and get started with my mixtures of my secondary colors. So first I get started with the green, I'm just bringing out a little bit of my Windsor Lemon into my blue, which is my phthalo blue, to create green. 
This looks a little bit too much like a blue green, so I need to add in a little bit more yellow to get it looking more like a secondary green color and not a tertiary green. Meaning I don't want it to look like a yellow green or like a blue green. I want it to be more like a secondary green. So I alter the ratios of my two colors until I arrive at something that looks like a secondary green to me. Now, if you have any doubt on what a secondary green, a secondary purple, or a secondary orange look like, I would recommend either buying a color wheel or just looking up color wheels on Google and you're gonna find a ton. And that can be a, a reference that you use when you're creating your different color mixtures. It's time to create the purple. So I add a little bit of phthalo blue into my alizarin crimson. And I add in a little bit more of my red, a little bit more of my blue, until I arrive at something that looks like a secondary purple to me. I don't want it to look too much like a red purple or like a blue purple. I want a kind of mid-range secondary purple. Once the color looks good to me, I start painting in this section in my cool color wheel. Once I'm done with painting in my purple, I'm gonna clean out my purple out of my mixing area so that I can create my orange and make sure that there is no purple or blue mixed into my orange. And then I start mixing in some of my alizarin crimson, which is the cool red that I have chosen for this color wheel into my Windsor lemon. And I mix in a little bit more Windsor Lemon, a little bit more Alizarin Crimson, until I arrive at something that looks like a secondary orange to me. I don't want it to look too much like a yellow orange or like a red orange. Once the color is what I want it to be, I go ahead and get started with filling in this area, nice and quick. And with that, I'm done filling in my two color wheels. I'm gonna allow these to dry and then I'm gonna come back to just make some observations. All right, so now that everything has dried, when I compare these two color wheels together, I can see that the cool color wheel has more brighter colors in it than the warm color wheel. If you compare the two yellows with each other, the two greens with each other, and even the two blues with each other, the cool versions or the cool options are brighter and create brighter color mixtures. Now, of course, the specific primaries that you've chosen for each color wheel are gonna have an impact on the resulting mixture. But nonetheless, you're going to find a difference in your warm and cool color wheels when it comes to the brightness of your colors. And you're likely going to find that there are more brighter colors in your cool color wheel than in your warm color wheel. So I just want to encourage you to take note of the differences that you observe in your own experiments. And also ask yourself, which colors do you personally prefer? Which colors would you like to use in your own paintings? If you were to ask me, I prefer the green in the warm color wheel than the green in the cool color wheel. But when it comes to the blues, I like the cool blue more than the warm blue. But I like the purple that warm blue creates more than the one that the cool blue creates because I tend to go for more muted down purples. I'm not a big fan of magentas and bright kind of pinkish purples. So even though I'm not a big fan of ultramarine on its own, I like the purples that I can create with ultramarine blue and I also use ultramarine blue a lot to create darker browns, to create grays, and to create darker versions of different colors for shadow areas. So we got a lot from this exercise in terms of color temperature and also color mixing, 
But now that we have this finished result, I just want to encourage you to give thought to all of these things. What do you personally like in terms of the color by itself and also the resulting color mixtures that that color allows you to create? This way you can make more intentional choices that really reflect your own art style more and your own voice uh, in future pieces that you'll be creating. All right, so I could finish up this video right there, but I frequently get questions on neutrals. What happens when it comes to color temperature in browns and in grays? So I just wanted to add in this last part in this video, talk a little bit more about neutrals. So what I did is I took out a few different gray or black options from my palettes or sets, and also many different brown options. First, I'm gonna be swatching out these colors by themselves on their own, and then we'll talk a little bit more about how to alter or even darken these different neutrals. First, I am swatching out my three grays or blacks that I have. The first one was Neutral Black from St. Petersburg. This one right here is also from St. Petersburg, and I'm not even gonna to try to pronounce this uh, name. I'm going to have it here on screen for you, but it's a black that looks a little bit more like brown. It is definitely warmer than the first black. Right here, I am swatching out Payne's Gray from St. Petersburg, and you can see the huge difference in temperature between the second black that I swatched out, which looks a lot warmer, versus this third gray that I swatched out, which is Payne's Gray, which looks a lot cooler. Finally, I promised to swatch out Payne's Gray from Windsor & Newton's professional line just so that you can see how these two Payne's Gray from two different brands are different, how one looks even cooler than the other one. This last one is Payne's Gray from Windsor & Newton, and you can see how it has more blue in it than the Payne's Gray from St. Petersburg. So in other words, the Payne's Gray from Windsor & Newton is cooler than the Payne's Gray from St. Petersburg. And the most neutral of my blacks or grays that I have swatched out is of course Neutral Black from St. Petersburg, the very first one. And hopefully you can see on screen how this Neutral Black looks flat and almost dull when you compare it to the other three that have a very distinctive temperature to them. Those other three look a lot more vibrant and interesting. They have more dimension to them. If I ever used a ready-made black that is very neutral like that in any of my full pieces, I would definitely use it in combination or mixed with another color so that I can really use it in an interesting, more vibrant way. Make that black come to life by adding in a little bit of another color into it. If you're looking for a warmer uh, gray, then you can add in maybe a little bit of red into it or a little bit of orange or a warm brown, such as a burnt sienna. And if you want it to be a little bit more cool bias, you can add in a little bit of blue or even purple into that ready-made black. And you're gonna end up with much better results, especially when you're painting with watercolor because using very flat, neutral, ready-made blacks like that can be very stark looking in a watercolor painting. But to be honest, you don't even have to have any ready-made blacks or grays on your palette because you can create your own grays by mixing together enough of two complementaries, so opposites in the color wheel. And I'll also let you know what my favorite uh, mixture for creating grays is. I'm gonna be swatching out these gray color mixtures for you right here on this extra sheet of watercolor paper so that you can see what they look like. This first gray was created by mixing together blue and orange, which are opposites in the color wheel. I mixed together ultramarine blue with some Hansa yellow deep, which is pretty much an orange. And right here, I am exploring what happens when I mix together green and red which are also complementary colors in the color wheel. What I am mixing are Viridian Green and Alizarin Crimson. But I want to encourage you to try mixing other reds and other greens together and see what happens. And I am making sure to bring in 
around 50% of each color into my mixture until I get a gray. I add in a little bit more green, a little bit more red, a little bit more green until it looks like a gray to me. Right here, I'm gonna be swatching this out for you so that you can see how I also get a very nice looking gray that would look great in shadow areas and paintings. Just as a little side note here, notice the previous gray swatch that I created before this one. It has now completely dried and you can see some color separation there. Even though it still looks like a grayish color, you can now see how certain sections look a little bit bluer and other sections look a little bit like a grayed out green. And this has to do with the pigments that I mix together to create that color mixture. Ultramarine blue is granulating. And this leads to color separation and texture as the paint dries. Lots of watercolor artists enjoy bringing in granulating colors into their palettes because they use this granulation for texture in their pieces. But it all comes back to you and what you like and what you enjoy. If you don't like this color separation happening, you can simply explore other blues that are not as granulating as the ultramarine blue and create your gray or brown color mixtures using those blues. And I wanna share one last gray color mixture with you, which is my favorite way to create grays because of how versatile this color mixture is. And this is by mixing together brown and blue. It works well with any brown. It can be a burnt sienna, it can be a burnt umber, sepia, Van Dyke brown, anything like that. And you mix that together with ultramarine blue. So right here, I am trying to get in 50% of each color until I arrive at a gray. Gray. And what's so cool about this color mixture is that when you mix blue and brown together, you can get gray if you have 50% of each color in your mixture. But if you have a little bit more blue than brown in your color mixture, it's going to look like a dark blue. And if you have more brown than blue in your color mixture, it's going to look like a dark brown. And you can very easily alter the color temperature in this mixture depending on what it is that you want. If you have a little bit more brown in your color mixture, it's going to look slightly warmer. And if you have a little bit more blue in your color mixture, it's going to look slightly cooler. And of course, as we'll be talking about in just a bit, there are certain browns that are warmer than others. So if you use a warmer brown, like the burnt sienna that I just used here, you're gonna be able to make that gray warmer more quickly than if you're using a very dark brown, such as a sepia or a Van Dyke brown. So it's a very versatile color mixture. So don't be afraid of creating your own grays and your own browns or altering the ready-made gray or the ready-made browns that you have. Swatch it out and try to tell whether it's warm or cool biased on its own. Consider what you want for the piece that you're creating and try to stay away from flat, dull, stark looking colors, especially when it comes to blacks. All right, so now I'm gonna be swatching out a whole bunch of different browns for you. Getting started with the browns straight out of the pan. The first brown is Raw Sienna from Bango. This is a light, beigey, golden color, and it's very similar to Yellow Ochre. The next color that I'm gonna be swatching out is Yellow Ochre from St. Petersburg. You'll notice that this is quite similar to Raw Sienna. It is also a very light, beigey brown, kind of like a golden color. The way that I see it, raw sienna and yellow ochre are very close to yellow. Yellow, of course, is a warm primary, so they are pretty warm. The third color that I swatched out is burnt umber from Bango. This is a much darker, more chocolatey brown. Moving on to my next brown, and this is a Van Dyke brown from Vango. This is an even darker brown, and it looks much cooler than the previous options. This next brown that I'm swatching out right now is Burnt Sienna from St. Petersburg. You can see how this is a reddish brown. And because Burnt Sienna has a lot of red in it, it is definitely a very warm brown. This next brown is Raw Umber from Windsor & Newton. 
in terms of lightness to darkness it's kind of in between it's definitely not as light as my raw sienna and my yellow ochre but it's definitely not as dark as the van dyke brown and what it comes to color temperature it's not as warm as the burnt sienna which is the reddish brown right next to it but it's not as cool as the Van Dyke Brown. If you observe closely, it looks like it has some yellow in it. It looks like a golden brown. Okay, so moving on from there, I wanna show you a few different ways that you can create your own browns. So first and foremost, there is that blue plus brown color mixture that I was talking about before, which is super versatile. And I just wanna bring it back into this explanation because you can create a cooler brown by adding more blue into it, and you can make a warmer brown by adding more brown into your mixture. So once again, I am mixing together burnt sienna plus ultramarine blue, and I'm gonna be creating three different color swatches with the same mixture right here. In that first one, you can see how it looks more like a grayish color, and this is because I had more blue in it, but the next two colors look a lot more brownish, and this is because there was a lot more burnt sienna in that color mixture. The more burnt sienna I add in, the lighter and warmer it becomes. And if you were to mix together burnt umber, which isn't as warm as the burnt sienna, you're gonna create a dark brown, but it's not going to be as warm as the brown that you could create with the burnt sienna, which is a warm brown. For this first brown in this last row, I wanted to show you other ways that I darken browns. This is burnt sienna plus a little bit of Payne's gray, but you can also bring in neutral tint, neutral black, or any other gray or black, add it into your brown in order to use it in a darker way. Any gray or black that you have, you could add it into any of your browns, whether it's burnt sienna, burnt umber, raw umber, whatever the case may be, to create a darker version of that brown. And of course, if you use something like a Payne's gray, which is a blue biased or cool biased gray, and you add that into your brown, then it's going to alter the temperature of your brown. But if it's like a neutral black or a neutral tint, because it's neutral, it's not going to have that big of an impact on the color temperature of that final mixture. Now, when it comes to creating a darker version or a darker value of a very light, beigey, golden brown, like the raw sienna and the yellow ochre, those first two colors that I swatched out, Usually I like mixing in a brown instead of a gray to darken that. I feel that the color changes a lot if you go right in and add black or gray into it. And this is because the color is so light and blacks and grays are very dark. And so I much prefer to first add in a medium or darker brown to create a kind of mid-tone. And then later on I can add in an even darker color if I'm really trying to stretch those values and those tones. So this is what I would do to create a slightly darker version of raw sienna or yellow ochre. This first one is a mixture of raw sienna and burnt umber. And the second one that I'm creating is a mixture of yellow ochre and I'm gonna be adding in burnt sienna into it. And you're gonna see how I end up with darker versions of my raw sienna and yellow ochre but the yellow ochre and the burnt sienna create a warmer look because I mixed in burnt sienna into it, which is a reddish brown, versus the one in the middle, I mixed in burnt umber, which is not as warm as the burnt sienna. However, if I compare that bottom brown right in the middle there with many of the other browns that I have swatched out, it's still a lot warmer than a lot of these other ones. So I hope that this last part of this video where I swatched out these neutrals for you and tried out a few different mixtures helps explain how it's really all relative and you have total control over making your neutrals warmer or cooler depending on the effects that you're looking for, depending on your tastes, depending on the mood that you want your composition to have. And I hope that I've encouraged you to not only expand your knowledge on color theory, which is such an important fundamental for any artist to know, but I also hope that I managed to communicate that color theory and color mixing don't have to be that hard and that I've inspired you to try color mixtures of your own.
Did you enjoy this tutorial? I really, really hope you did. And if so, make sure to check out everything that I am offering over at my Patreon membership website, because for a very small amount a month, you're gonna get immediate access to my exclusive tutorials, classes, and resources that I don't share anywhere else. All of these exclusive tutorials include my downloadable outline sketches so that you don't have to start from scratch, reference photos, and my supply lists. There's already a library of over 75 sketching and watercolor painting tutorials that are real time, meaning they are not sped up or edited. They are fully narrated. And I take you through my entire process, making sure to explain everything as clearly as possible, step-by-step. Step. Two new exclusive full length tutorials are added into this exclusive library every single month. For those of you who are interested in really taking your artwork to the next level and want to know all of the inside secrets that I learned about in art school and courses that I've invested in myself, there's also a full library on classes on art fundamentals in which all of the bases are covered. That library has now over 35 classes and workshops all have assignments at the end that help you actually put your knowledge to the test. And there's a brand new class or workshop added at the beginning of every single month. As if all of this weren't enough, you also get a weekly sketchbook prompt sent to your inbox to help you stay consistent with your art practice. There's a live training, workshop, or paint along session with me every single month. Members in the $15 tier and upwards get access to thorough feedback from me on their work whenever they need it, and much, much more. There are different tiers that you can join that give you access to different things, which you can choose from depending on your goals and needs needs. So go ahead and check it out. I'm going to make sure to leave a link where you can find out more down below in the description box of this video. And I would love, love, love to get to know more about you and your work and have you join this innermost art community of mine. All right, you guys, that is going to do it for today's video. I really, really hope that you enjoyed it and that you found it helpful. And if you did, pretty, pretty please make sure to give this video a thumbs up because it really helps support the work that I am doing here on YouTube and helps others get to know about my channel. Thank you so, so much for watching today. Don't forget to subscribe and click on that little bell so that you can be notified of when I share my new videos, which happens every single week. Have a beautiful rest of the day and see you soon. Bye guys.